Okay. So the first question that I have for you guys, the troll, I mean, I expect some amount of trolling, right? So I didn't ask if y'all were going to troll me. I asked, are you going to troll me constantly? Okay. Just, just like, give me an answer though, because otherwise this doesn't work. Then I'm just like talking to myself and typing on a, on a word document. Okay. So let's start with this. What is meditation? Let's start there. What is it? What do you guys think? Okay, beautiful, right? So this is perfect. Thank you guys for not trolling me when I ask you to... You can troll now. Tur troll, troll switch back on. So people are saying focus. They're saying no thinking. They're saying reduction of thought, right? So they're saying, okay, so state of mind. Focusing, not thinking. Awareness. A way to calm the mind being present. Beautiful. Okay, so those those answers are good enough. Okay, so let's just look at this for a second. Is this one thing or is this more than one thing? Does that make sense? Like when I look at these things, are we talking about one thing? Or are we talking about like more than one thing? Okay, some people say one and some people say more. So I think this is a great way to start about meditation. So Let's 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 use parts of speech, okay? So state of mind. What part of speech is this? What is a state of mind? What are we talking about? You guys know what parts of speech are? Like nouns, verbs, adjectives? It's a noun. A state of mind is a noun, right? Okay. Focusing is what? Verb. Very good. Not thinking is what? Verb. Very good. Awareness is what? Noun. Very good. Right? A way to calm the mind is what? Is a, yeah, so so it is a sentence. Well played, chat. So like when we talk about a way to calm the mind, like what's the what's the operative? It's an action, right? So th this is describing an action. Does that make sense? So you guys control troll away. Fair enough. It's a sentence, but this is an action. So let's call it an action. Okay, verb. So like this is defining a verb. Does that make sense? And being present, what is that? Ah, now we get some confusion. Verb, noun. So being is a verb, right? So let's just leave that one. So the first thing that I want to point out to you guys is this doesn't make sense. This cannot be one thing, right? Because like if you're describing something, it's either like a noun or a verb. It's not both, which is weird. Like when we think about meditation, oh shit, I should have been recording. Damn it, okay. When we think about meditation, part of the problem is that people talk about, okay, so like when I ask people what is meditation, they say, okay, like I sit down and I like try to empty my mind of thoughts. And so that's kind of a verb. And then other people, when they talk about meditation, they say, like, I suck at meditation. When I ask them, you suck at meditation, what does that mean? They say, like, I can't empty my mind. Like, my mind is unable to be emptied. And then other times I talk to meditation, uh, talk, talk to people about meditation, and they say, like, oh, yeah, I had a really fantastic meditation session the other day. And I said, well, what makes a meditation session fantastic? And they're like, well, I really got into the zone, and I was, like, in this, like, no mind state. Okay? Talk to meditation, yeah. Um, so then the question is like, well, how is that possible? Like, how can it be something that you do and also like a state of mind? So this is where we go to Sanskrit. Okay. So, dharana, dhyan, samadhi. Okay. So dharana is focusing. Dhyan is a state of no mind. And this is bliss slash temporary enlightenment. Okay. So Sanskrit is a language. So this is so what we translate as the word meditation in Sanskrit actually has at a minimum 
three words that all get translated into English as meditation. But these are very different things. And this is why when I ask people, like, what is meditation, I get all kinds of answers. None of them are wrong, but it's weird because, like, something can't be a noun and a verb, right? Like, that's just not how stuff works. Either it's an object or it's an action. It can't be an object and an action. So now when we get to meditation, the first thing to understand is that when, when I teach you guys to meditate, meditation is, is being used as a verb, right? We say, like, I meditated for 15 minutes. I'm going to teach you guys how to meditate today. That's a verb. So what that really means is a dharana or a focusing technique. So dharana is the process of focusing. It's, a te it's the action of focusing your mind on one point. So focusing mind on one point. Sometimes when you're doing dharana and when you get good at dharana and you focus your mind on one point, then you enter a state of dhyan. So this is the no mind state. And this is what people, when they say like, I, I suck at meditation, what they're talking about is that they have trouble attaining dhyan. And when people say I had a really good meditation session, what they're talking about is that they had like they entered dhyan relatively easily or they hung out in dhyan for a while. And dhyan is pretty cool because when you're in dhyan, so like a sense of self falls away, right? Because like sense of self comes from the mind. You're kind of like just chilling, tranquil, right? Because you're kind of just existing and you're peaceful. And so it tends to be like reju rejuvenative. Um, and if we think about like a state of no mind, like let's think about anxiety. So how like... Anxiety is, is like a super active mind, right? So if you think about what's going on in anxiety, you're having lots and lots of thoughts very rapidly about all kinds of things. So how is it that meditation is helpful for anxiety? Well, it, it's two things. One is that as you get good at dharana, this is a skill, by the way. So dharana is something that you can like, so dharana is skill that can be leveled up through XP, right? So you can train your mind, if you have anxiety, you can train your mind to focus on something besides the thoughts that it wants to think. And if we think about anxiety, like anxiety is an uncontrolled mind. Like even people who have anxiety know that it's useless to think the thoughts that they are thinking. And people want to stop thinking those thoughts. They don't feel good. They don't do you any good. It's not problem solving. Sometimes it can feel like problem solving, but it's just useless, repetitive thought. So through dharana, you can train your mind to focus and keep its attention on one point. So that can help anxiety. The other way it helps anxiety is by entering a state of dhyan. Because when you enter a state of dhyan, you have no state, like you have no active mind. And if you have no active mind, you can have no thoughts. And so in that place, you're kind of chilling. And like, this is exactly why people, like, this is what people want when they have anxiety. They want to be chilling, right? They don't want to be thinking. And as you enter the, the state of dhyan, all kinds of stuff falls away. So like when the sense of self falls away, reduces ego and narcissism, right? Because if you're like, you're just kind of like chilling. And then when you're chilling, like so reduces anxiety. Um, yeah, so like reduces anxiety, like reduces the internal experience of negative emotion does all kinds of other stuff. So when we think about why medit like what is meditation, the first thing is there is a verb component and during the verb if you're lucky you'll enter a state of dhyan which is a state of mind. So this is not something that you can do. You cannot do dhyan. Okay? So now let's go to the next thing. So let's talk about dharana and dhyan and think of an analogy. So I want you to I want to ask you guys um so who here slept last night. Anybody sleep? Okay. So we're going to play a little game where I'm going to pretend for a moment that I don't know how to sleep. Can you guys teach me how to sleep? Like, how do I sleep? Okay. So just close your eyes. Okay, great. Am I doing it? They said, just close your eyes. I'm closing my eyes. Am I sleeping? Is it working? This is sleep. Okay. 
Good job. Okay, so let's say like I, I lay down. Relax your head. Okay, I can do that. So I'm laying down, right? I'm chilling. Is it sleep? Stop talking. Wait for it. Be tired first. Right? So you guys can tell me whatever you want. Like, you can say, okay, lay down. But that's not sleep. You guys can say, yeah, you're... you're, you're so, czar, or, or however you say that is right. Like, you're pr pretend to sleep. Your mind has to shut off. Okay, that's what fair price is saying. Slow your breathing. Be tired. Count sheeps. So, like, what are all of those things? Like, so here's the thing. Just go to sleep. Okay, perfect, right? So here's the thing. It is impossible to go to sleep. You can go to bed, but you can't go to sleep. Sleep, oddly enough, is not a verb that you can do, right? So we think about, we define sleep as a verb. We say, I slept for eight hours last night. But you can't actually sleep. Like, it's not something like, I can pick up my phone. I can put my phone down. I can unscrew a water bottle. I can drink the water bottle. Drink the water in the water bottle. I can't drink the water bottle. Right? I can do all kinds of things. So when people say, like, okay, so they say, lay down, turn off all your lights, stop streaming, close your eyes. And I can do all of those actions. Those are all actions. Right? But... None of those are sleep. Closing your eyes is not sleep. Getting under blankets is not sleep. Laying down is not sleep. So, so all of the things that you guys are describing to me are verbs. And dhyan is a noun. Okay. So this is like going to bed and falling asleep. Sleep is a state of mind. It is something that happens to you. It is not something that you do. And that's what's so confusing for people, right? Is like, you think like, okay, how do I go to sleep? Because we confuse, we, we think about sleep as a verb, but it's not really something you can do. You can go to bed, but you can't fall asleep. So dhyan, the state of meditation, the state of no mind is achieved if, cross your fingers and you're lucky, when you are doing dharana, sometimes you will achieve a state of mind called dhyan. And that's the meditative state of mind. And it's just like going to bed and falling asleep, as people who have had insomnia have discovered painfully, which is painfully true, is that you can't make yourself go to sleep. It's not something that you can do. You can do a bunch of stuff, and if you're lucky, you'll enter the state of sleep. So the first thing to understand about meditation is that it's translated into multiple words in Sanskrit. One is a verb, is a focusing technique, is a dharana. That's like a meditation technique. And the second is the goal of meditation is to use that technique to enter a state of mind. But you do not control whether that state of mind happens. You can sort of increase or de uh, decrease risk factors for that happening, right? So you can like light certain kinds of incense or meditate at the same time every day or do it at particular times of the day. Um, and, and so you can, there, there are a lot of things that you can do to sort of cultivate and hope for dhyan in the same way that you can cultivate and hope for sleep. But you can't make yourself go to sleep. You can't make yourself enter a meditative state. You can just cross your fingers and hope. There's some things you can do to facilitate it. So like, you know, my, you know, my treatment, my personal treatment for insomnia is to eat a burrito and then listen to biochemistry lectures. It tends to work really well for me. And because that's not, I can't go to sleep, fine. I'm just going to listen to biochemistry lectures after eating like a gigantic burrito. And then the physiologic stuff and then like the biochemistry is just so godnumbingly boring that, you know, I'll fall asleep. And so in the same way, you can cultivate a state of mind of dharana, a dhyan, through dharana. So this is what meditation is. Okay? Questions? So is dhyan like sleeping? Beautiful. Excellent question. Okay, so we're going to play this game again. Oh. Insert table. Okay. So, consciousness. Have we done this before? Chat, is this familiar? So let's talk about states of mind. Consciousness and mental activity. Yes. Oh, sorry. Wait. Uh, have you guys seen this before? No mental. Act no mental activity.
or let's say this, no consciousness. Okay. With Rackful, very good. Okay, so then you guys can help out. So let's think about states of mind, okay? So the first thing is, what do we call our current state of mind? If I have mental act, so what is our current state of mind? Is Do we have mental activity right now? Yep. Mental activity, yay or nay? <laughs> yes, right? Are we conscious, yay or nay? Conscious, yes? Yes? Okay, excellent. So this is awake. Okay. So let's say that we have no mental activity and no consciousness. What do we call that? Ah, is dreaming a state of mind? You're getting ahead of yourself, my friend. Sleep. Right? Or death. Sure. Unclear, though, right? Because we haven't been dead. You guys haven't been dead, so you actually don't know what the state of death is like. So we're going to delete that, because we actually do not know. We can talk about the state of mind of death a different day. Okay? So then, let's think about dreaming. So someone mentioned dreaming. So, uh, dead on the inside. <laughs> so what is dreaming? Are you conscious during a dream? So we're going to say no consciousness. Ah, see now most people are saying so lucid dreaming. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Are you, so no consciousness, is there mental activity during a dream? Let's not worry about lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is the exception, not the rule. Right? So your mind is active, but you are not conscious. Dreaming. Okay? Now, let me ask you guys something. What is the consciousness state of a daydream? Or like, let's start with this. When we use the phrase daydreaming, are we talking, is there mental activity? Yes or no? There is mental activity in daydreaming. Is there awareness in daydreaming? So the other way, other thing that we can call this is awareness. Right? So this is kind of cool. Because we intuitively, just think about this for a second. We describe a particular state of mind that we experience while we'll technically awake, and we call it daydreaming because it's actually the same box of mental activity and consciousness as dreaming. That's why we call it daydreaming, because intuitively we recognize that this state of mind is like a dream. It just happens during the day versus happens at night. Like, like do you guys get that? Like, it's really bizarre that we use the phrase daydreaming because, but it's actually not because we intuitively recognize that your thought, that you can be thinking without being aware. So maybe, okay. So now comes the important thing. So thinking and awareness are completely different. What goes in this box? What do you guys think, meditate? Uh, what do you guys think for chat? Very good right? So this is meditation. It is to be in a state of mind, or dhyan. Very good. For those of you who said dhyan, that's even more correct. Where you are aware, but there's no mental activity. Excellent. Twitch chat is, is playing. I'm impressed, Twitch chat. Thank you guys very much for not trolling me. Okay, next thing. Types of meditation, okay? So the first thing is, like, someone give me a meditation technique. What's a meditation technique? Okay, very good. So third eye technique, right? So charge the laser beam. So if we think about that, what are we doing? We're concentrating on a particular thing. Okay, so this is a dharana. So give me another technique. Okay, so then people are saying mindfulness. So let's talk about what is mindfulness. Let's think about this. Do you guys know what mindfulness is? Right, so mindfulness has a couple of attributes. So it's focusing in the present, or being in the present, 
present, observant, oftentimes observing the flow of thoughts without engaging, okay? Um, Non-judgmental awareness. So the interesting thing about mindfulness is like, like, so let's talk about, so let's, charging the laser beam is the third eye technique, okay? For those of you who don't know. So concentrating on a spot between your eyebrows. So let's talk about alternate nostril breathing. Is, you know, concentrating on the flow of breath between nostrils. Okay? Or in nostrils. Right, so. Okay? You guys with me? Yeah. So, and then, so the first thing is that these techniques are different, right? So in one, you are doing something. So this is dharana. So these are doing, doing meditations. And then these are not doing or just observing. Let's call it observing meditations. Okay, so now this is, do you guys get how this is fundamentally different? Do y'all get that? Like these are different, right? Like in this, you're doing something. You're focusing your concentration. This, you're just chilling. You're sitting back. Okay. Now I have a question for you guys. Um, shit. Okay, hold on. So do you guys think that these are different things? Do you guys think fundamentally, like, are these, are these doing the same thing in your mind? Yes or no? Somewhat. Okay, so now I'm going to show you guys a really cool paper. Okay, you guys ready? So. This is a, a paper by a guy named David Silverzweig, who's chief of psychiatry at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence, a framework for understanding the neurobiological mechanisms of mindfulness. So this paper is fascinating. And what people have done is they've done studies, so like um, usually EEG studies. So EEG is an electroencephalogram, so it measures the electrical activity of the brain. And what they've done is they've taken different ty types types of meditation and i think what they've basically done like so here are two types right so one is the dharana the doing meditation another is the observing meditation so this is so this is self regulation is the dharana self awareness is the mindfulness kind and what they've done is looked at the eeg patterns of people who are do doing different meditation techniques and what they've discovered uh, is that actually like what's happening in your brain when you do these different things is actually like fundamentally different, creates different patterns of electrical activity in your brain. So different kinds of meditation techniques are, these are actually different and they do different things in your brain. Okay. So the third kind of, we can sort of further uh, sub subdivide things. So if you guys want the reference, we'll put it on our discord. Um, okay. So this isn't, I mean, so this paper, if you guys really want to get to the EEG part, so this is, uh, I like this paper because it's a framework. So what these guys have done is they've like looked at all of the research and they propose a hypothesis that explains why the studies are the way that they are. Oh, weird. Okay, hold on. Let me try this again. 404. There. Maybe I mislinked. Otherwise, you can just Google Scholar this. You can Google Scholar that. Okay. It's the top, it's the top link if you do Silver Swag in meditation. Okay, we'll post this to our Discord. So this is pretty cool because what this tells us is that like these techniques which feel very different, right? If you do a mindfulness technique, I'm gonna tell you to close your eyes and you're just gonna listen. That's gonna be like you're it's gonna be a different experience from focusing your mind on something. So then so that's one one change. So then now we're going to talk about meditation. So I think the biggest difference in terms of meditation techniques is they're observing techniques and they're doing meditations. So 
And then different... How can I say this? So... Okay. So, Dharana, I'm going to just delete these, okay? Doing meditations. So these tend to be sensory or grounding. Okay? These are open... So, open awareness or mindfulness. Okay. So now I have a fun question for you guys, okay? Very good. Passive versus active. Okay. So now I have a question for you guys. Um, if someone is having a panic attack, which technique do you think is better? Ah, very good. Now we're getting disagreement, right? So just think about this. So when someone has, so you, there's a, ah, doing, yes. Okay. So this is what happens. When you have a patient with PTSD, okay, <laughs> or, um, so a good example of this, I mean, Mitch Jones is not a patient, but like what happens when Mitch meditates? You guys know? Y'all, do y'all watch that? Yeah, right? So when someone is having a panic attack, you want to use a grounding technique. So a good, techn a good version of this is ice diving. So this is a really powerful grounding technique. So ice diving is when you take like, you know, like a, you take a bowl of ice or like a bucket of ice and water and you stick your face in it. Okay. And so, like, if we think about what's happening when you stick your face in a, in a bucket of ice, like, or ice water or cold water, it pulls your attention from your thoughts to the stimulus. So alternate nostril breathing is another good example. Third eye is another good example. But do you guys see how, like, this is going to pull your attention more powerfully than alternate nostril breathing will, which will pull your attention more powerfully than focusing on the third eye? So grounding techniques, so if we think about the doing meditations, there are sensory or grounding techniques which are going to powerfully pull attention, your attention away, okay, to, to the, the, the sensation at hand. So here's a really crazy thing, okay? You guys ready for this? You know what else is on here? Cutting. So if, so I don't recommend that you cut, but if you talk to people who engage in self-harming, okay? You talk to them about why they cut. So sometimes these people are suicidal. But if you actually ask them, so I, I've taught meditation to you know people who suffer from a lot of self-injurious behavior. And I ask them questions and I'm like, what, why do you cut and how does cutting make you, make you feel? And what they inevitably describe is that when they cut, like they feel the sensation so acutely that it like calms them down. And something about the pain focuses their mind on the sensation of pain and actually gives them relief from whatever they're feeling on the inside. So I believe that cutting is actually like almost in a weird way, like a, a negative, like a harmful form of meditation, but it focuses their attention on the present. Because if you talk to these people, their feelings of suicidality are actually different from their desire to self-harm. And as they start to feel worse about themselves, self-harm gives them a, an opportunity for relief. So since cutting is injurious, right, like we don't want people to cut because it's like medically a bad idea to do this. You're going to get scars. You can get infections. This is not a good idea. This is why we teach people who have self-injurious behavior to meditate. And this is also why when you take the psychiatric conditions that have a high degree of um, self-injurious behavior. So a good example is borderline personality disorder. So these people tend to self-harm quite a bit. The best evidence-based treatment for borderline personality disorder has its roots in meditation. So the cool thing is that what you want to do for these people is give them a replacement for the cutting. So if you teach them ice diving or alternate nostril breathing or something else, because third eye stuff is a little bit too like hands-off for them to begin with, they actually start to get better and they stop cutting because they don't need to do the cutting anymore to like relieve themselves of the mental pain. Okay. Yeah, please do not cut. I'm not recommending that you cut. What I'm saying is that cutting, if we analyze how it works, it actually is like almost a form of meditation. Okay. 
Now, what happens when someone like so when we have like a patient with PTSD or something like that or an anxiety attack, we want to do doing meditations or grounding meditations or sensory meditations. So the way I want you guys to think about this is depending on how unharmonious your mind is, you want to do more of a grounding or more powerful technique, right? So we're going to do one right now. So I'll give you guys an example of a powerful technique. So we're going to do bees breath or Shanmukhi Mudra and Brahmari Pranayam, okay? So this is the first step. All right, so pinkies on the corners of your mouth. You guys do this? R ring finger at the groove right outside of your nostril, okay? And then we're going to put middle finger here on the inside of our eyes. Index finger here on the outside of our eyes. And then thumbs are going to go inside the ear canal. So stick your thumb in your ear. And then you're going to take a deep breath in. And buzz like a bee. Again. And one more time. Okay. So that's hard because like if you guys are actually doing the practice, you're not going to be able to hear me. So did you guys do it? Yes? No? So what happens in your mind when you do that? <laughs> okay. So we're going to do this again. Let's teach this to Ms. Kiff today. And you guys got a primer today. We're going to do it again with Ms. Kiff in a little bit, okay? We're going to practice more. We're going to teach Ms. Kiff. We'll talk to him about how it feels. The goal is that, you know, generally if you stick your ears, I mean your thumbs in your ears and you buzz, mm -hmm. so do that five times. Uh, for just a breath. Each one is one breath. Five breaths. And so notice what happens to your mind. Yeah, so this is hard because if you guys are doing it, it's like the, 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 you know, the problem with teaching you guys meditation is because Half of y'all bofos actually meditate, and the half who are not actually meditating are the ones who are left in Twitch chat. And so that just screws us up, because we get like... <laughs> so that like the only answers I'm getting are from the people who have no idea. Right? It's just like, it's like setting ourselves up for disaster. Okay. So anyway, so we're going to teach Ms. Kip, and we'll ask him, because like, you know... Fuck you guys. <laughs> and so if you guys did it, you'll hopefully see. I mean, I say that with love. Hopefully you guys understand that. A bit too far? Okay, I apologize. Um, so really, really, I'm sorry if that hurt anyone's feelings. It was, it was uh, not intended to do that. Okay, but hopefully you guys see that... Um, <laughs> That's completely acceptable. Hold on. Prime check? What does that mean? I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Okay. All right, let's finish, let's finish talking about this. Um, what? Okay. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means. 
I'm confused. Did I make a mistake? Is it n not a good idea to to be mean to Twitch chat? Um, okay, but seriously, if you guys did the technique, let's try to wrap this up because I think we've got Miskiff in a couple minutes. So if you guys did the technique, like hopefully you'll see that it's like it's a powerful sensory stimulus, right? So it kind of like knocks the thoughts out of your mind. So it's it's kind of like a force push if you're a Jedi. You just like force push your mind and like the thoughts just go, they, they, they pop off, right? The interesting thing is that if you take someone with PTSD or a, a panic attack, these are the kinds of meditation techniques you teach them. Because if you just teach them to calm their mind and open it up, if you teach an observing meditation or an open awareness meditation, then what happens is like all of those negative emotions are going to come up and they're going to overwhelm them. Which in a sense is good because you're, you're kind of... Um, uh, you know, in a sense is good because, you know, they're, they're ventilating that stuff, but you don't want to make it to be like a painful experience for them, right? You want to like walk them into it. And I think this is what we see with Mitch. So Mitch has so much stuff that's happening like right beneath the surface that even if I tell him to do like a, a sensory or grounding technique, he's got so much emotion that once you calm the mind, you can kind of like see what's down there. You kind of relieve the pressure of the mind and then all the stuff comes up and it can be overwhelming. So meditation actually has some contraindications. So meditation is not like without risks. So, um, you know, you want to be careful. Like, so you want to do meditation like slowly and carefully. If you experience any kind of negativity, you know, take a step back. You don't want to force yourself to do something that's extreme. Um, and, and generally speaking, you know, just take it, take it easy, take it slow. There are case reports of meditation induced psychosis. So let's show you guys that too. Okay. So here's an interesting um, case report that talks about meditation-induced psychosis. So there are case reports of meditation actually, um, you know, leading to like psychotic episodes. So you guys got to be careful. Generally speaking, it's going to be fine, but... Um, so psychosis is when you either like hallucinate or you lose a sense of self or um, you can feel like like invaded by other people. Like this, the, the area between you and other people starts to break down, which is the best way to describe it. Maybe I'll do a talk about psychosis along with anxiety and depression, and ADHD and things like that. Um, so meditation induced psychosis is a thing. So be careful. Right, so if you're doing any meditation technique and it, it feels like dangerous or scary, like just stop, take a break, don't force yourself into it, relax a little bit, and then you can try again later or do a different kind of technique. Um, so open awareness meditation techniques are different. And then like there's another layer of things. Okay, so then they're also like there's mantra. So mantra, so now we get, so, th so far everything that I've talked about is relatively, oh, this is all relatively scientific, right? So there have, been, there have been papers that have been studied this stuff. We've done EEGs, things like that. So then the other way to look at meditation techniques is not actually scientific at all, but is more spiritual and is actually how they're taught, right? So there's like mantra med. So there, there are dharanas, focusing techniques. Okay, so actually let's start with this. There are pranayams. This is non-scientific. Okay, now we're going spiritual. So these are breathing techniques that are designed to balance the flow of your life energy and calm the mind. So these are like purification techniques or calming techniques. Uh, the alternate nostril breathing is a good example of a pranayam. The bee's breath is a good example of a pranayam. Then there are pratyaharas, which are sensory withdrawal techniques. So these are things, so generally speaking, our mind, oh man, I wish we had more time. Okay, we'll talk about this next time. So pratyaharas are, are techniques that are designed to, to train you to withdraw your attention from the senses and direct your attention inward. And if we think about like procrastination and all kinds of other problems that like, you know, pe gamers have. So if we think about like, you know, staying up like until four in the morning um, and watching YouTube video after YouTube video after YouTube video, even if it's our channel, is like not a good idea, right? So if we think about like, why do you watch YouTube videos till four in the morning? It's because there is a part of your mind that 
is sensory and is like going towards a stimulus in the outside world. And then it goes to the next stimulus in the outside world, next stimulus in the outside world, next stimulus in the outside world. I'm walking down the street. I smell a hamburger. Oh, I want to eat a hamburger. My mind like, okay, and then I go and I end up eating a hamburger. So like poor diet choices, staying up too late. These are all consequences of a weak mind that cannot restrain so the attention of your mind follows your senses instead of like you controlling the attention of your mind so these are a set of techniques that are designed for you to restrain your mind and direct it where it wants to go where you want it to go instead of where it wants to go these are kind of like training a dog to walk where you want or you know use or potty train that's what these are like. So after Pratyaharas come Dharanas. So these are like focusing techniques. And then there are a couple of other versions of this. Okay, so one is Mantra. So this is chanting a particular spiritual phrase to accumulate power. Okay, so this is basically like magical spell, essentially. Right? Um, and then we also have like Chakra sadhana. That, that's really what it is. Like, if you guys, like, study it academically, it's like a magical spell. Like, you chant something over and over again to accumulate a particular kind of energy, and it's supposed to have an effect. R remember, guys, this is not scientific. I'm just, I'm relating to you guys what is written in the books about meditation and trying to organize this information. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. This is just explaining information, okay? So chakra sadhana is meditations that purify the chakras and are aimed at cultivating a particular... Okay, let's put it this way. Aimed at leveling up a particular domain. So a good example of this is anahat chakra meditation. So Anahat Chakra is your heart chakra. And your heart chakra, um, you know, when you do meditations around the heart chakra, it's my belief that like, so you cultivate like compassion and empathy. So it's different techniques that sort of work on you and your mind to like cultivate a sense of like compassion and empathy. Okay. So it's my belief, this isn't supported too much by science, actually not much at all, but it's my belief that as you do different kinds of techniques, it can enhance like different parts of your brain. So, and there's some, you know, there's some very preliminary evidence like the EEG, uh, this is kind of a big jump, but we know that different kinds of meditation techniques do different things to your brain. It's my hypothesis that what they sort of figured out, like what the yogis figured out is they did a bunch of meditation and they sort of realized like, okay, if I meditate in this way, my, my compassion or empathy increases. If I meditate in this way, my intuition increases. Um, and so I don't know if that's really like, this hasn't really been validated through science, but that's just, it's just another option. Um, yeah, so I think this is like a good example of different kinds of meditations, okay? And then, yeah. So that's our bit on meditation. Okay? Yeah, so it's like, so tantra is a part of mantra. Oh, sorry, mantra is a part of tantra, so this includes tantra. Right, so, okay. All right, let's talk to Miss Kiff. So we're going to take a quick break while we get connected with Miss Kiff. Um, how, oh, okay, so actually first, let me ask you guys to a chat. What was, like, you guys like that, don't like that, more of that, less of that? Like, talk to me. Okay, so what about the balance of, like, science versus non-science? Okay, so, so what I'm hearing, so because I've heard, like, different things from different people, right? So some people say, I want more science, I want more spirituality. Like, I was surprised, I was never planning on talking about spirituality on stream. Like, that's personal for me, but you guys seem to be interested in it. And what I think is, like, we can look at it both ways, right? So we should just understand the limits of what information we present. So, like, I think it's fine to read textbooks on yoga. I personally find it, like, interesting and engaging, and I learn a lot from it. 
but we should understand that that's not like necessarily scientific. So when it comes to these different kinds of meditation techniques, if you guys are interested, so I have some degree of faith in that. And also like using those texts, I developed a meditation program that targets neuroscience deficits in people with addictions. So there's actually like, I looked at, so there's a lot of uh, data about, um, you know, what kind of, uh, meditation, addiction. So I'll show you guys an example. Um, So here's an example of a paper, okay? So this is what I did. I sat down, looked at a bunch of information about neuroscience deficits in addiction. So tried to figure out, okay, like what circuits in the brain, when someone is addicted, what circuits in the brain aren't working properly? Then what I did is I went to a bunch of these like old texts on yoga and meditation and stuff like that. And I tried to map out like what kinds of techniques, according to their theory, will improve the neuroscience, like will improve like a particular capacity and like what part of the brain does it target basically for each meditation technique. And then I looked at the parts of bra the brain that it targets and then I put all those techniques together and then I made a meditation program and then I went to a bunch of people with addictions when I was working at a rehab and I taught them this meditation regimen. It worked wonderfully, right? So they normally learn meditation and mindfulness. It's big. They go to different places and they learn mindfulness. So there's some issues here because like, is it just learning mindfulness? Like mindfulness in general will help. The question is, if you do create a targeted protocol of meditation, can you correct neuroscience deficits in, in drug addiction? My belief is yes. And I think it's possible. And I think it sort of speaks to, yeah, I think it's possible. Anyway, so, um, and then we have like some data of this. So I want you guys to understand very clearly like what I'm saying. So I'm very confident in the science of the background of what I'm saying. So there are basic science studies, but the more and more, the closer we get to application for an individual human being, the less I can speak scientifically because then it's clinical evidence, right? So it's my, it's my experience as a clinician, but there haven't been studies done on some of the stuff that I'm talking about. And then some of the stuff is like completely spiritual where it's like, that's just what the texts say. I'm not, you know, it's not scientifically, hasn't been studied yet. Um, but there is actually a guy who was doing like Anahat Chakra meditation studies um, and, and trying to see if like you can improve people's compassion and you can. So some of this stuff actually has been studied. Anyway, let's take a break. So what I'm hearing from you guys is you guys like this. You want more. The balance of science and not science is okay. Um, in, in terms of like detail, like do you guys, like I tend to explain a lot about like basic concepts. But I think, you know, you guys seem to like that. 